Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is our uh, second panel of Tribeca Film Institute at the New School, uh, which is part of our series of new forms of storytelling. Uh, my name is Vlad Nikolic. I'm from the Media Studies and Film Program. I know a lot of you. And tonight we're going to talk about distribution. We have a notable panel of guests here, and our moderator is going to be Jim Brown, who is one of the senior programmers from Tribeca. <laughs> and uh, also has his, um, has his own distribution company called Argo Pictures, so there you go. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you for having us all here. Um, tonight's panel, Festivals, Theater, VOD, and Piracy. Um, I think we've got a really extraordinary panel here for you tonight. Um, so I'm gonna uh, first run through a um, brief introduction of everybody, and then they will all talk about uh, the various companies and projects that they're working on. And uh, we'll have a little discussion, and then we'll open up the floor for some Q&A. Um, uh, right over here on my left is uh, Paul Lovelace. He's a New York-based director, editor, and producer. Um, his documentary short, Robert Christgau, Rock and Roll Animal, about the esteemed music journalist, won acclaim in 2000. Um, in 2006, Paul produced, wrote, and edited a PBS documentary, American Roots Music Chicago. Um, as an editor, Paul has worked on series, commercials, and promos for the Food Network, Travel Channel, Rockstar Games, numerous music labels, and more. Paul's documentary feature, The Holy Modal Rounders, Bound to Lose, was released theatrically, on, uh, re released theatrically and on DVD in 2008, and he's currently at work on Radio Unnameable, which is co-directed with Jessica Wolfson, a film about the freeform radio pioneer Bob Bass. Uh, to Paul's left is Liz Ogilvy, VP of Marketing at B-Side Entertainment, um, which is an Austin-based full-service film distribution company that uses technology to discover, market, and distribute independent films. Um, Liz is based here in their New York office and oversees all marketing initiatives for the company. Uh, prior to working for B-Side, um, Liz was head of IndiePix's film, uh, she was the head of IndiePix Films, where she was responsible for all marketing and sales initiatives for their slate of fiction and non-fiction films, uh, plus a catalog of over 3,000 films a year. Um, before that, uh, Liz was head of programming at Docurama Films. Uh, excuse me, to Liz's left is Megan Cunningham of Magnet Media. She's the founder and CEO. At Magnet Media is a leading interactive media company and creative studio behind Zoom In Online. Um, Zoom In Online is a site providing daily coverage of contemporary culture, entertainment, and technology through podcasts, blogs, and internet and mobile video. Uh, Megan is also an author. Her first book, The Art of the Documentary, um, was recently published by Peach Pit Press, New Riders, and Division of Pearson Publishing. And finally, Eliza Licht is from um, PBS's POV. She oversees the development and implementation of POV's national community engagement and education campaigns. Uh, she works with public television stations, educators, and community-based organizations to present community screenings of POV films and to develop and distribute accompanying educational resource materials to teachers nationwide. Um, so we'll start out today's discussion with um, hearing from Paul Lovelace. Uh, we'll talk about uh, his project, uh, Radio Unnameable. Hi. So I'm going to talk about two of my films and kind of use them, uh, use those as examples of how um, we sort of took on distribution um, ourselves, trying to get the films out there and finding an audience. Uh, the first one, which Jim mentioned, is called The Holy Modal Rounders Bound to Lose which uh, was completed in 2006, and it's a feature-length doc about this New York City kind of 60s psychedelic folk group, um, and kind of followed them during a resurgence that um, started in 2000. So the film took a while to make, and we had a pretty healthy festival run, I guess, I guess that was in 2007. And, um, and you know, it did, it did really well. It got into a lot of festivals, and we got a few DVD offers, but nothing theatrical. And, you know, realistically, we figured out, I mean, it, the film is about a fairly marginal band, and it's not, you know, it's not the type of film you could just dump in theaters worldwide and, and be able to sustain itself. So 
We, um, at the same time, though, we were getting calls for people who wanted to book screenings, and, and um, you know, we wanted to try and get it out there as much as possible, because we were going to put it out on DVD eventually, and we wanted to bring it to audiences all over. So we were trying to figure out ways to do it, and one thing that myself and then my co-directors, Sam Wainwright Douglas, what we did was we tried, we wanted to have fun with it. We didn't want to just have a night where you show the film, do a Q&A, and then that's that. So we tried to team up with uh, short films, guest introductions, musical acts, and turn the whole thing into an event. And we found really early on that this worked well. I mean, it wasn't, you know, you're not guaranteed to have a packed house, but it certainly helps. And, um, and plus it makes it more fun for the filmmaker because you get to, utilize all these people around you. And in our case, the film's about a band, so um, we were able to use them with a lot of the screenings. So that did, that did really well. And we were able to do longer runs in certain cities, but, um, and that experience was kind of, um, you know, kind of an eye-opener. And right now, I'm getting, the film's on DVD, and it's kind of got a life of its own, and um, starting on a new film called Radio Nameable. My, co-directors in the audience there, Jessica Wolfson. And um, so we're kind of in the earliest stages of the film. And I'm going to show you a brief trailer in a second here. But um, one of the things that we're already doing is thinking about what's going to happen when the film is done. How are we going to get it out there? How do we lay the groundwork to find an audience for the film? So um, maybe we could watch the trailer, and then I'll kind of talk to you about what, uh, what we're doing at this point.
So with this film, I'd say at this point, we are probably have shot about 30% of it. And we're starting to, you know, it'll be done, the goal is it'll, for it to be done by the end of next year. And so we're, one of the things we're trying to do right now is setting up things um, to where we can reach out to potential audience members, you know, all over the place. So with a character like Bob Fast, since he's sort of, as you can see a little bit in the trailer, he kind of touches on a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of different areas. So uh, whether it be radio, whether it be activism, the counterculture, music, um, you know, how you can draw a clear line to what he did then to, you know, certain, certain um, kind of, out, like Facebook, Twitter, certain things that are happening today, uh, we really are, um, are trying to find all these different communities and different people who we can get excited about our film and then hopefully after it's done and played some festivals, start booking screenings all over. So, you know, for example, one thing we're planning on doing now is with our website, we're trying to design this sort of video component where we, you know, there's different community radio stations all over the United States, all over the place, really, college radio stations. So we're trying to create a channel and just reaching out to, you know, some station in Stockton, California and say, you know, send us a two-minute video, you know, shoot it on your cell phone, but give us a tour of your station, show us who you are, and then trying to put up a lot of different videos like this to kind of build this sort of network around the film. And um, so that way when we start playing festivals, you know, we already have a little bit of the legwork done. And you can also build upon uh, the previous film I did. You know, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of screenings and, you know, use a lot of those contacts to try and go back and show the film again. So that's just, and I find that a lot of filmmakers that I know are doing similar things. With, um, even if you're just starting to shoot your film even, or writing the treatment, you're already thinking about what kind of outreach you're gonna do because um, it's so important in these days because it's harder and harder to get your film into theaters. So it's really necessary to think of other, you know, other avenues or any, really any way you can to show it in front of an, in front of an audience if that is what you want. So that's, um, that's my... Okay, now we'll hear from uh, Liz Ogilvie from B-Side Entertainment. Yeah. I, I don't have uh, a trailer or anything to show you, uh, but I can definitely talk to you about the sort of, um, the reasoning behind B-Side Entertainment and how it got started, and why I'm very excited about working at B-Side, especially when there appears to be a sort of panic out there with regard to theatrical distributors and how the model's broken. And I feel at B-Side that we have a solution, I hope, to this problem. But how it sort of started five years ago is our CEO, Chris Himes, who actually comes from a filmmaking background. His brother is a filmmaker. He did a couple of films, one called Smashing Machine, which was about ultimate fighting, and another film about bull riding called Rank, uh, both very macho films. But um, they both had a phenomenal life on the film festival circuit. And Chris uh, actually has a technology background, but he would be going to these festivals with his brother and there would be standing ovations, lines around the block, sold out screenings, people would be you know, raving about the film and his brother's films then went on to be picked up by a theatrical distribution company. Films released into theatres across the country, nobody showed up. So what is the disconnect between the audiences that go to fest film festivals and the audiences that go to theatres? So Chris, uh, our CEO at, at B-Side decided there has to be, what is, let's try and do something through technology to get between the films and the audience. And our sort of tagline comes from Billy Wilder, which is the audience is never wrong. And so what, so what he then did was, down in Austin, uh, created a, a company that for the past four years has worked exclusively with film festivals and created a, uh, a sort of signature uh, a proprietary uh, technology which actually creates a ratings and reviews and recommendations, kind of similar to what Netflix does, uh, where participants who attend film festivals will be able to do their scheduling through something called Festival Genius, where you can figure out you know, what films you want to see, what times, if there's any conflicts. And, and then once you see these films, you can rate them. If you liked them, if you hated it, you can put comments. And based on that information, over the space of four years, we have over four and a half million email addresses. 
we've got research about 26,000 films. And so we have like a lot of data and a really specific data that could be used in some way uh, for either acquiring films and also finding really specific audiences that like perhaps comedies, horror films, anything out there that might have, or documentaries, whatever it might be. And then last year, Liesl Copeland at that time, who was heading up uh, Red Envelope, the distribution part of Netflix, contacted Chris because they had put money into a film called Super High Me, which has stars comedian Doug Benson, and it's kind of a, a take on uh, marijuana uh, that Morgan Spurlock ate burgers for 30 days, Doug Benson smokes marijuana for 30 days and sees what it does to him sort of physically. Um, so the dilemma or the challenge that Netflix had was, oh my goodness, we've just put all this money into film and our audience is a bunch of stoners who are not gonna get off the sofa. So they are definitely not gonna come to a theater, so what do we do? And in speaking to Chris, it was like, okay, well maybe what we do is because there's nothing better than sitting in a room and watching a film with other people who like that particular subject matter. So why not create a, a, a one-day screening event on 420, which unbeknownst to me is kind of uh, stoner's Christmas, um, and have this full-on uh, blowout screening where let's give the film away, let's try and create that phenomena, let's try and create that buzz, and, ha and direct all everything back to ancillary sales, DVDs, digital downloads, whatever you name it, because at the end of the day, that's where the theatrical distributors make their money. So why not just give the film away um, and host a screening? So we called it Roll Your Own Screening, um, mm. and lo and behold, uh, reached out to the, the audience that we had acquired through all the festivals, reached out to all the festival partners that were part of the B-Side family, and on 420, there was 1,500 screenings around the country. Wow. And it, it just took off. And after a few months, uh, it, Super High Me is still the number two watched film on Netflix. And there's been over 1,600 screenings around the country and it's sold 90,000 units of DVD. And there's been a marketing spend of $8,000. Yeah. Now that is something which you think that's just a one-off, you've tapped into a particular audience. But then two films later, Crawford, and also before the music dies, using the similar principle of tapping into that audience, people who love the subject matter, and, and similar to what Paul was saying, is sort of really figuring out who the audience is for the film. And with three successes under the B-side belt, the distribution arm was started in January, and that's where I work here in, in New York. So using the same principles, we've now got eight films on our slate. We work very closely with filmmakers, uh, because obviously they know the films intimately. And what we do is we take over their websites and because I have the luxury of having a fantastic um, IT department down in Austin, we can really have some fun and we can really be nimble and we can really sort of add a bunch of bells and whistles onto a website and make a really kick-ass website where when people are actually coming to the website, for them to host their own screening, uh, they're actually given the tools for them to actually get excited about hosting a screening. So that's the kind of B-side model and um, so it's really kind of, giving the film to people who really want to see the film, but also keeping those marketing dollars really, really low. So at the end of the day, the filmmakers can actually see some money and on the back end. And we work very closely. We have a partnership with Virgil Entertainment, which used to be Arts Alliance, that funnily enough, works with Morgan Spurlock and Super Size Me. Um, and uh, so we go through you know, a traditional home video distributor, uh, but we believe in exhibition. We believe in the non-theatrical model. We believe in hybrid versions. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's to get these films out and to find that audience. And that's what we've been working on, and we've been having some success. Um, a couple of films I'll just um, mention. Uh, we, we do both documentary and narrative. We had the luck of acquiring a film by the name of Visioneers uh, that stars Zach Galifianakis before he was in The Hangover, so we completely lucked out there. Um, but having said that, the reason that we did acquire the film was because you know, we poked around online to find out that Zach himself has a, a really scary following, like people who are obsessed with Zach Galifianakis. And you know, he's on Funny or Die, he's, his audience lives online, and we love that type of um, a, a audience member, I suppose. And um, so reaching out to Zach's fan base, and he is a, a, 
a list of maybe, I think now about 200,000 rabid fans. And with their help, we ended up, I think we've done about 600 screenings around the country. And, but we created some really fun things. We had a contest online. Um, you all know Zach Galifianakis from The Hangover, Bored to Death. We did a Zach alike contest. Um, both male and female people participated. Um, but we had a lot of fun. And um, so that's kind of the, what we did with Visioneers. And then we're now, we've just recently acquired a film by the name of Still Bill, uh, which is a portrait of Bill Withers. Uh, the iconic soul um, uh, singer performer who did such hits as Lean on Me, and uh, which is really great. So we're working very closely with um, his fan base um, and with him being a musician. Obviously, there's a lot of people who are out there that are aware of his songs, but don't necessarily know the man. But I think every single musician imaginable has covered one of his songs. So it's kind of a, it's going to be a really interesting. Uh, we're putting together a marketing plan right now with regard to that, but his again, his audience is, is it's mainstream, it's all ages, and um, and it's just the case of being really kind of creative about how to actually target them, um, and that's basically what's happening at B side. So, I'm here from Megan Cunningham from Magnet Media. Sounds like you could have gotten a sponsor for Doritos or something oh. for that last screening. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so, uh, Magnet Media is New York city-based production company. We've actually been around for 10 years, and for the first five and a half, we did very traditional production um, documentaries for television, some corporate videos, um, but from the last four and a half, we've been entirely, we did sort of a transition um, where we are entirely focused on <laughs> interactive. Sorry. It's okay. This is one of our shows. <laughs> That's okay. You can start if you want. This is traditional media and transition. This is just one episode that we did on uh, Thomas Allen Harris, who's an independent filmmaker based in New York. An award-winning filmmaker, producer, and director with work that been featured on PBS. Am I getting that flash? <laughs> The film I'm making right now is called Two Women's Doctrine. It's a documentary about black photographers who use the camera as a tool for social change. It's my fourth feature documentary. I come from a family of photographers in the beginning years, and they left me this huge archive. So I kind of, with each of the films, place the archive into the larger public record. So moving from a personal archive into something that is both national or international. The films were tough and gratifying, but at the end of the process, with each film, I said, I've got to do more in terms of the outreach beyond broadcast. They've been broadcast on PBS, they've been broadcast on cable, they've been broadcast on international television. And you know, by the time I get to the end of these films, I'm exhausted. I could not really do what I wanted to do with the film in terms of activating the community. And part of what I want to do with films is activating the community. And so I decided with this film, Through a of Darkly, that I would make the multimedia outreach a part of the production. What we're creating is a multimedia outreach project entitled Digital Diaspora Family Reunion. It's a project that will allow for the film, the production, to distribute elements to an audience and that will also invite them to upload their content and map black photographic content across the country. It will allow black photographers to have a kind of clearinghouse, to have a voice, both contemporary but also our ancestors. They'll bubble up from the shoeboxes and these photographs I kept and make a reappearance and insert themselves into the public record of what Americans look like and have looked like over the last 200 years. What new media offers filmmakers right now is expanded possibilities. Nothing has to end with it. Everything can be repurposed, repackaged. And so my idea is for us to actually repackage modules from the film and use it, distribute it on our website through a web darkroom.tv weekly, like a serial, as a way to attract people, as a way to build an audience 
for the broadcast. It's this coarseness in terms of audience and filmmaker. You know, this direct contact. It's not like the film ends here and begins there, but it actually morphs a little bit and shifts around. And so who knows what's going to come out of that. What's really exciting for me right now is the potential of new media to allow filmmakers, storytellers, to provide stories, content, and outlets that not only give people information, but also allow them to insert their own stories. And this whole issue of user-generated content is you know, potentially revolutionizing the way in which we define ourselves. Stop it. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to note that Anita Yu, one of our editors, um, is actually the editor behind that piece, too, so she's in the audience. Um, but uh, as far as, you know, just sort of putting in the context of that piece, I thought it was sort of relevant to the discussion that we're having today, because I think a lot of people are struggling with this transition that the whole industry is going through. Um, but for independence, you know, it's the typical sort of roll up your sleeves and uh, DIY to a certain degree, and obviously there's opportunities to partner with um, you know, amazing groups like B-Side and POV, but I think ultimately it's so advantageous if you can also educate yourself and um, much of what Paul was saying, I think I, I fully agree with, you know, there's opportunities to really do a tremendous amount of research in terms of who your audience is and finding affinity groups that you can um, align with and leveraging tools like Facebook and Twitter, um, which are incredibly powerful as well as YouTube and iTunes and really um, approaching it almost like you would um, an independent launch, even if you're not doing the dis distribution yourself. So I think, you know, everyone's sort of searching for this like magic answer of like, well, how is the internet and mobile devices really going to, you know, where, when are we going to start monetizing? When are even big media companies going to start profiting from, um, you know, this this next wave of distribution platforms? And I don't think there's going to be a singular answer. Is my own sort of, you know, that's the bad news. Um, I think it's very custom tailored to the project. Um, as we heard so far tonight, um, and that the advice is really specific to the project that you're working on. You know, one set of documentaries may work really well on iTunes or YouTube in terms of getting an audience and finding a um, set of evangelists or a set of communities that adopts it and forwards it and promotes it, um, whereas, you know, another sort of uh, short set of features would work much better through a singular blog that requires you know, registration in order to see it, and if you make available the trailer, that might be the best strategy. So I think sort of coming up with the answer for your project is one of the most challenging things, um, but the way in which we produce is serial content on a regular basis, and so and it's all ad supported. So we have a team of um, 20 creative people in just north of the Flatiron Building and studios um, that where we produce regular shows um, that are in one of the channels is aimed at professionals, where um, you can see series like the traditional media and transition series. Um, uh, and then there's also a film channel, a music channel. Um, a design channel, um, and we use um, the format in two different ways. One is um, just to develop audiences, and, and we have sponsorship from companies like HP and Apple and Lexus and Toyota, um, and then we also, um, so that's sort of like its own independent channel where people are coming to see the shows free of charge and, you know, they're su uh, surrounded by either display ads or a post roll video, um, and so that that's how the funding for those shows is off, you know, gets off the ground. Um, but then the uh, the other option is, the, or the other way I should say that we've used um, the new media platforms has been as a development tool. And we have we're actually actively negotiating right now two of our series um, that have been um, we've had interest from traditional media players. One which is a major film distributor, the other which is. Um, a television series. So I think there's a lot of, like it's not like a very f clear foregone conclusion as to how you should sort of approach your new media plans, but um, my personal opinion is that there's, um, you know, a lot of avenues. Uh, the biggest hurdle is to promoting um, the project itself and that there's a lot of avenues to do that yourself um, in order to get traction and whether you then take that, those promotional 
views on YouTube or metrics reports from Google Analytics or whatever it is that you're sort of capturing that data and then bringing it to a traditional distributor or a non-traditional distributor, um, that that gives you a lot of leverage as an independent. So that's like one set of, of answers. And the other answer would be um, to you know sort of read up on the ways in which um, companies like ours are monetizing um, online video and just seeing that as like the singular platform because it's definitely possible. Thank you. Um, before I begin, just by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with POV? OK, good. Uh, uh, very briefly then, um, we are a award-winning independent nonfiction film series on PBS. And uh, every year, we receive close to 1,000 submissions that are narrowed down to 10, well, 14 to 16 slots um, for every film that we have on POV, we create a national public awareness campaign. I have been at POV since uh, 2001, and I've noticed um, a fantastic trend, I'd say, where filmmakers are really becoming more and more savvy about outreach, and where uh, when I first started, I would sit down with people and we'd sort of start the outreach <clears throat> once the film was finished and come up with a broadcast plan, now more and more people are coming to me um, with their partners with a plan in place and really sort of running with it. So I'm going to briefly go over um, some of the things that we do uh, at POV to spread the word and, and gather an audience that I think uh, can translate um, for films in general, not just uh, promoting a broadcast. But uh, then I'm going to show you two clips and then give uh, some examples of what filmmakers from this season have been doing, which I think are really exciting. Um, so uh, our public awareness campaigns are, include um, community and marketing strategies, online strategies, and community engagement strategies. Uh, for every film, we have a companion website. Um, we do a press campaign and a community engagement campaign, um, which includes you know, the ability to host screenings where we lend out the films um, in, in, again, non-traditional settings. Um, two takeaways everyone should do. Um, work with partners, people that are already interested in it, as Paul said, sort of building your network as you're going, um, whether it's a social issue um, or a band, uh, music, you know, gather folks that are already interested in it and bring them with you. Um, they will help promote it. They have built-in audiences. It's, I can't say it enough, partner with different organizations, bring them to the table early. Um, and then second, just make it as easy as possible for people to use the film, promote the film, get it out there. Um, I will show you a couple examples of just how we do that online. Um, and if you have a well-written press release, and people will use it. <laughs> they will adapt it, and they will use it because people need content. So um, I am uh, going to start with that. Uh, if you want to just roll the two clips. The clips first. I'm so excited for the summer. I'm gonna grow into my adulthood and just be independent for the first time in my life. Me and my friends want to go to the beach on Friday. No, you have to come and help me. Let me check the way that I don't want to be brother. Who is here like you? Think you're gonna turn 18. So you have the right? You don't think, I don't know. You don't know what I think. So I wish my dad was here. My dad was going to say stuff like that. Dad, is my room ready? And I want a jacuzzi. <laughs> you said you were cheap, I should get it. <laughs> Sir. Independent point of view documentaries. 
you have to go to Bangor, Maine. You can't believe the kind of welcome that the troops get. And it doesn't matter what time of the day or night these flights are coming in, there are people that show up every single time. Bottom home, hero! I thought we were just going to walk into an empty terminal. None of us were expecting anything like that. None of us. Get it, get it, get it. Welcome, welcome, guy. Appreciate you. There's cell phones in there, pretty heroes, talk all you want. Call somebody up, make them happy, ugly, or <laughs> How long can they sustain this? You know, they've been doing this, and they, they're still there. Just don't stop for you to get off or get out. The world just keeps right on turning. Everybody has trials and tribulations. Two of my grandchildren are going in January. Every day, that's the deal. That's what we say. It's not my day. It's not been a bad trip at all. Some don't come up from long line. It's not a big deal. Death is something uncontrolled by human beings. Age, how rich you are, what you're doing, doesn't matter the picture. You're gone. So um, the first film, Bronx Princess, Yoni and Musa, the filmmakers, came in and um, we met with them and one of the things that they said immediately is they wanted to have a big screening in the Bronx, which made sense, and that they wanted to do um, a street party and really bring in the community in, in different ways. So they uh, had a partnership and we partnered on the screening as well, but with Rooftop Films, um, who have outdoor screenings. Um, in New York, and uh, Rooftop had never done a Bronx screening, and we, they got a permit. We did it in a park, and um, had bands, West African bands, play in the beginning. They brought in um, folks who do art projects, and um, and uh, in order to underwrite it all, BJ's uh, was opening a store locally. And so Yoni um, spoke with them and said, you know, I think uh, this would be a great way to draw in the community. And they went for it. And so the entire thing was underwritten by BJ's. Um, so that was a you know, really successful example of a local screening that was done and sort of not just a screening and a Q&A and obviously the filmmakers were there and there was a Q&A afterwards but it really sort of brought in all these different aspects. Um, and then the second film, The Way We Get By, which is going to be on uh, next week uh, at 9 o'clock, uh, Aaron and Gita came in and they were actually, they didn't come in, at, they came in even before we had accepted the film on POV. They were part of uh, WGBH, had a filmmaker in residency program and they came in with a 15 minute trailer and we were um, just sort of giving the POV 101 and ha how we deal with campaigns. And Gita uh, already had a list of partners that were involved with the event um, and a million questions. And I was extremely impressed in how far along she was. And um, once we did accept it, um, sort of the story of this film is really incredible. And um, I encourage all of you to reach out to the filmmakers because they are really um, so wonderful and giving and willing to talk to folks about it. But the campaign is, is really, really exciting. And um, just recently, um, it was September 30th, there was a screening on Capitol Hill. And um, Gita had been trying for a long time to sort of get in there and just sort of kept calling, kept calling. Um, and uh, found anyone that was from Maine that was working um, uh, on the Hill and eventually located somebody who was from Maine that was working in Jill Biden's office and um, got Jill Biden to agree to give remarks, introductory remarks before the film and then the whole Maine delegation got involved and there's just momentum behind this film and it was really just sort of her tenacity. So, you know, I, I encourage that as well. Um, I was able to be involved in that screening and it was um, really powerful 
to be there and just sort of to watch um, just what calling can do, um, you know. And um, that's really it. I mean, I did have a, if you want to pull up, I can actually walk over quickly. Just to show you an example of, um, yeah, this page is perfect, actually. They show your support for the way we get by, which is really just easy ways to promote. It, this is promoting the, the broadcast, but you guys can do this. Um, partners will put this, you know, the trailer, give them the YouTube trailer. I've been amazed this year in particular, but also last year, how many people are putting the trailers up on their sites. Um, <coughs> obviously, hosting a screening, we have that built in on our site. Um, and. Facebook and Twitter, and there's a hashtag, and all of the partners have been using it. So, um, just in terms of just putting up the trailer, both in YouTube or um, the amount of people that are willing to take that and promote it is incredible. Um, so, that's it. This is the takeaway. Thanks. Um, it's interesting about uh, the way we get by. Um, as somebody who uh, works with filmmakers to book films theatrically around the country, um, this film came to my attention this summer. I didn't end up working on it, but when I first was told about it, and they said it's about uh, senior citizens in Maine who greet troops coming and going from Iraq, my immediate knee-jerk response is, well, the theaters don't want to show anything that has to do with Iraq anymore, so I don't even want to see it. Um, which was just, you know, uh, small-minded on my part, but I was encouraged by a few different people, you know, just take a look at it and don't think about it in those terms. And, um, and I was, you know, absolutely blown away because the film isn't about Iraq. It's really about these people. It's about loneliness. It's about community. Uh, it's about family. And um, it's really something that kind of transcends those trappings. But, uh, you know, I bring it up because I think... Um, you know, these are the types of hurdles that all filmmakers will encounter when it comes to trying to get your film out in the world. And while there are plenty of people who, I mean, who want to give you good advice about what to do or what some of the pitfalls are that, you know, uh, hearing, well, anything related to Iraq, there's no way you're going to get out in the world, you know, it, this doesn't mean that, you know, you should sort of heed that advice all the way and just, you know, hang it up because this is a case of a film that actually really got out there in, in a big way theatrically. And, um, but that also is, a, I think, a, a function of just the tenacity. Like you were saying, these filmmakers yeah. are absolutely tireless and brilliant in their efforts. And also kind of, I mean, from my experience, just seem pretty extraordinary people that um, in, you know, are really good at getting people to get behind them and work with them. So, I mean, that's another thing that um, you know, I encourage when I talk with filmmakers is when you want to get groups and individuals to help promote your film, you, you want to help them feel, you want to make them feel like they're part of your experience and part of your team and that you're not just sort of exploiting them to promote your film, which you know, in a certain degree you might be, but if, if they actually feel that you know, they have an in, sort of investment in, in helping your film find a life, uh, you know, like Eliza said, people will go very far and do a lot of work on your behalf, so uh, I encourage you to see this film. It's really spe special. Um, also, one other thing that you brought up, which I think is really important, is if you have a community of filmmakers and you know you're in the thick of making your film or whatever, seek advice. I mean, there's nothing better than your peers, and you know, poke around the web, poke around the web, and just see if there's any you know films that maybe be sort of bubbling up through websites. You know, it's through, sorry, through film festivals. And you know, reach out to filmmakers and just say that you know you're, you know, seek their advice um, because there's nothing better than um, going to people who've been through it themselves. So definitely, if there's anything that piques your interest, or there's any websites or any stories that you've heard, you know, you'd certainly reach out because um, I'm sure that like these filmmakers you were talking about um, are happy to to pass on that good information. Right. That that happens a lot. That happened a lot. We. You know, we would we did the festival, you know, this kind of festival circuit, and met other filmmakers, and um, you know, pretty much everyone is willing to share their resources, share their advice, um, you know, give you email addresses to theater bookers, and um, and people approach us, and 
you know, I think it's really important that you, um, you always do everything you can to help others because it just, you know, it forms this circle and it's good for everybody. I was just going to say, not to be self-promotional, but as a resource, we have the on the circuit where we interviewed the filmmakers of where where we get by in almost every other POV film, actually. And a lot of the questions that you know come up on those conversations, it's just an audio podcast, but um, are about this. You know, like what's the new sort of field of distribution? Because two years ago, I think most people would have said, like, really get you know your story straight when it comes to iTunes and YouTube, and be completely obsessed with those communities because that's your, your sort of best asset. And today, I think it's 100% about Facebook. I mean, Facebook is going to supersede Google's traffic like this year, you know? So I think that the hurdles of finding video through search, it's like, you know, your audience, your evangelists will promote that film as soon as they're aware of it on Facebook. It's so easy to do that. And I think like having a solid Facebook strategy, if there's one thing you take away from tonight, that's where you're, you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. Uh, uh, absolutely. And when I, um, just from what I've learned over the few years is the fact that the phenomena that's sort of happening around social uh, networking and just viral marketing is, is incredibly powerful. Uh, so at B-Side, we actually have somebody who's a social media strategist, and that's all they do. And whether it be creating dashboards, keeping track, I mean, we're all about data and analytics and all the rest of it, but, you know, just to sort of see what work that we may be doing and be able to translate that into numbers is really important. And although it's incredibly boring in so many ways, it's actually incredibly important because you can actually track everything that you're sending out there, whether it be your trailer, whether it be clips, whether it be anything else, you know, you can follow what's happening. And, you know, you and, and that's really, really important. And especially getting it involved earlier on, uh, and exactly what Paul was saying with the film is like, don't think about your film once you've finished it. Think about it really early on when you're putting together your proposals, when you're actually putting together your team of advisors, you know, make sure that there's people that can help you all along the way, uh, because it's it is a long process, but you can make things so much easier. And if you do go to a POV or or anywhere else, or even to B side, if you come armed with lists and groups and and just and, and it doesn't take it's not that hard. Um, although I'm sure to a lot of filmmakers that whole sort of marketing business angle is it can be kind of overwhelming. Even if it's the case that you've thought about it, can go a long, long way in your film actually having a life out there. Um, yeah, I mean, one th one thing that I find uh, really interesting is the I, I think there's just more and more of a trend of everyone is starting to think about the film and then the release of the film as a sort of cohesive unit. I mean, that's one thing that um, you know we preach at my company is don't make your film and then think about where it's going to go after, but to really start um, making plans for that and how is this going to get out in the world and how do you envision it being out there and where is that going to be and who are these groups that are going to part with you and the sooner you can start figuring it out, the better. I mean, the, the difficulty I think for most filmmakers is it's very hard to make a film and you've got a million things that you're trying to do and wear a million different hats and sometimes, you know, the thing to do is to really try and find that partner early who can kind of help do some of that thinking for you and help guide you through that process because it is pretty overwhelming and you do have a million different choices and ways that you can go. Um, one thing that I think that was really interesting that uh, you know, Paul was talking about in terms of uh, you know, creating events around your film. I mean, this is something that we've done at Argo and obviously he's done really successfully um, with his work. Um, I, I, the thing that that I see as a programmer for Tribeca and somebody who books films into you know theaters is there's just so many films out there and each week you're competing with you know dozens and dozens of films that are opening and whatever you can do to distinguish yourself from everyone else um, in terms of creating events in terms of having speakers is only gonna you know up the ante for you in terms of really making people feel like I've got to get out and see that film on that Wednesday night or that Tuesday night and um, and I think that's really essential. Can you talk about some of your uh, sort of uh, the difficulties of doing that and so the complexities of that? It's not, I know from having done a fair amount of that, it's pretty labor intensive and time consuming, but. Well, I mean, you also have to remember, if, like, I mean, I guess the, the first thing you have to do, I mean, well, really, one thing when we were booking the screenings for the film I did about the Holy Model Rounders, um, 
I mean, we really had to get over any sort of uh, apprehension about making cold calls. And, um, you know, my, luckily myself and my co-director were okay with being persistent. Hopefully we weren't annoying, but we were okay with being persistent. And, um, and you know, the first thing, we found generally that most, uh, most people who booked these screenings were into it because if it, um, if, and they would be happy to allow it because it certainly doesn't hurt getting more people to buy tickets for it. And um, then the next thing we would do, I mean, we would really kind of book these mini tours and we would kind of cater whatever sort of um, event, whatever we would have around the film to where we were. Because we knew the band had fans all over. We knew they um, had sort of, uh, you know, musicians who were inspired by their music who would sometimes appear and play after a performance. Um, and then there were a lot of, a lot of theaters that would have a kind of a package deal where we'd show the film and then the band would play afterwards. And, um, and what often happens is a lot of the people who book these theaters, or even people in the audience, might um, tell another, you know, another theater somewhere else that, hey, this was great. And we would get a lot of calls like that. It sort of mushroomed at a certain point. And, um, and it was great, but we still, like, even then, you know, like, let's say if, you know, if they were on the screen in Pittsburgh, we would kind of look and see what's around Pittsburgh and look at those cities and just start Googling whatever would seem like an appropriate venue and just sort of start there. Um, I mean, it was definitely, you have to really want to do that, but, um, but I, you know, on, personally, I found it really rewarding. And uh, it certainly, the film eventually got a uh, distributor on DVD, and it, um, I think it really helped with um, selling you know, selling more DVDs and getting more people to ultimately watch the film in the long run. Um, Liz, you were uh, talking just about uh, having somebody who's the social networking strategist, and I, I, I'm interested in, in sort of how do you um, track uh, how people who connect with a film online actually end up showing up. I mean, I, when I started my company a few years ago, mm. I had these filmmakers who were using MySpace this was about four or five years ago effectively to get people excited about their film. And one thing they kept preaching was, we've had 100, 150,000 hits of our trailer on our website, and you know, this means we're going to sell out and do everything. And, and at that point, you know, I, I couldn't ex explain to them clear enough that that's great, but if that doesn't translate into ticket sales, mm -hmm. that means nothing to a theater booker um, that that's happened if you're not selling out for a week. And I know so much has changed just in the past few years in terms of mm -hmm. you know, how much more these networks are being used, but I'm kind of curious if mm -hmm. there's some sort of data about like, how you can sort of... Well, it's more kind of what, what we're sending out there. I mean, one of the, it's all very well you can send something out, you know, on the, out, out into the wilderness, so to speak. Uh, but what we do is we actually, everything's um, tagged with some information, but we actually have messaging and actually a call to action into whatever we're sending out there. So it's actually telling people what to do because it's all very well sending out a really cool clip or a really cool trailer, but you need to alert people to, hey, check out this website or if you want to host a screening or tell your friends or whatever else. Uh, so that's kind of, we're very kind of strategic about if we do have a particular clip, what the message might be. So whether it's directing traffic back to host your own screening or it's back to uh, buy the DVD, or it's back to pre-order the DVD. So if you're actually telling somebody to do something, that's how we sort of track it, mm -hmm. because otherwise it's a waste of time. So I think the advice that I can give is, for example, if you, know, you have your trailer, have some messaging you know, for more information, come back to the website, or you know, if you want to get you know, to raising funds for the film, a donation, um, if you want to direct people back to that, that's the sort of key behind anything that we sort of send out is we make sure that people, we're telling people what to do. Um, Megan, you were talking about uh, you know serial content and how that's being used on the internet. Do you have any um, examples of how uh, filmmakers are using serial content as a way to uh, draw attention to a f you know a feature film that's either in production or will soon be released, either be festival or theatrical. 
Um, wow, that's a tough question. I think, I, honestly, I think documentaries are doing a much better job online than feature films. Um, I would point to Joss Whedon, who obviously has a massive following already in television, so he's not really in the independent world necessarily, but he did do something very independent, um, which I'm trying to think of the name now. It starred Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, the, the horrible... Um, if, Dr. Thank Horrible. you, the Dr. Horrible yes. series, which is like a 36-minute um, webisode that he, they made available for free. I believe the first part, it was three parts, um, and then the rest of it you had to either pay for iTunes and the DVD. Um, and that was, you know, made, it was incredibly high production values for a, a short project. Um, and it, I think, believe it was low six figures were, was sort of the budget, so it's not like your million-dollar feature, but it also wasn't, you know a student film budget either, um, and they were in the black as of a couple months ago. So I think that that's, that's one example of something that just lived exclusively online. Um, and obviously they had you know, an embed, a pre-existing director with a following to uh, leverage. But I, th I do agree that you know, in terms of um, you know, sort of the best strategy and takeaway from all my fellow panelists is, is in terms of following, finding that one core either partner or a set of um, passionate people who will really not only just believe in the project, but will really be vocal about it. And it's like, you know, and there was two quotes that I would refer to. One was um, a couple months ago, someone said, uh, word of mouth, the trouble with word of mouth is no longer, it's not being done with mouths. Yeah. And I think that, <laughs> that, you know, that's an advantage if you're using the tools correctly in terms of being able to really um, get the awareness and the calls to action out there very cost effectively or free. Um, so, you know, I would also refer to um, the phenomena of, you know, how your audience is split between 90% of people who are, you know, would be interested in, but really just in watching it, 9% um, of which would be sort of passerbys but would po probably comment or forward to a friend or post to their Facebook profile. And then 1%, which is incredibly, incredibly passionate and is probably going to be like your number one vehicle. And you should do everything you can possibly do to embrace that 1%. Um, and that means giving them 10 DVDs to hand out to their, you know, nine other friends and, you know, put one on their shelf or on their desk, whatever it is that you can kind of give, you know, whether it's embed the tag um, like Gita did on, you know, the Where We Get By, um, enable them to Twitter about the film, enable them, you know, give them very explicit instructions so that it's not that difficult. There is no um, confusion as far as how they can help you promote the project um, because people, you know, th this is, I, I would say, you know, in the, in the same way in which the 80s, people started wearing, you know, big brands on their, you know, big Benetton sweaters or whatever it was that was sort of part of their identity um, in those, you know, social communities. Online today, people are doing that with media, and it's really an, identi an identifier as far as who you are. If you're constantly posting and PR links and POV links and, you know, talking to people about healthcare or your thoughts on this um, through media, um, that's, you know, a, self, a tool of self-expression that people outside the media industry are doing on a massive, massive scale. And I think, you know, the fact that you're in media or in filmmaking, um, you can tap into that social phenomenon um, that's, you know, culture-wide. Um, one of the, one of the, another great resource that we found certainly when it comes to documentary films is actually the characters within the film. Yeah. And obviously, being filmmakers, you have created this great relationship, or maybe not so great, but you've followed these characters for a long time, and invariably, they're in the film, and they might just be your everyday person, but they have a remarkable story to tell, and to sort of uh, recruit them in some shape or form if they're going to be going to festivals with you, but get them to start, you know, Twittering or on Facebook, um, because certainly with a lot of the, the documentaries, that whether it be social issue or just something ridiculous, um, we, are, we actually are working on a film called Last Cup, the World Series, uh, the, the, the road to the World Series of Beer Pong. We seem to be having doing drugs and beer right now at B-Side, <laughs> but anyway, um, where there's a couple of really hilarious characters that are in this film, and they're, they have, they're on Facebook every day, I, they, uh, they're playing beer pong every day, they're getting their uploading their photographs, they have stories to tell, and uh, they are our champions out there right now, and because they have a following. And as soon as anybody sees the film, they're lovable characters. Um, 
And I know it takes a certain demographic sometimes to do that, but from what I'm hearing, that the older generation are sort of get are the highest kind of adopters to Facebook right now. Um, so I would, you know, certainly garner those relationships and um, make sure that you know they are on for the they're on for the ride. Um. Um, that's a question for Eliza. Um, I know with uh, with some of the releases that um, that my company has done, we've done a lot of partnering with organizations, and in some cases, very big national organizations, um, to help promote the films as they released around the country. And in some cases, um, this went very well, and in other cases, uh, I was like extremely surprised in how little support we actually got from the organization, despite the fact that. That was ended. Up, that ended up being part of how I was able to sell the film to the theaters. That I was going to have, X, you know, multi-million member organization promoting the film from city to city, and they really didn't turn any people out. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the the techniques that you use to sort of ensure the, uh, yes, no, the viability of these relationships? Absolutely. I mean, like I said before, the earlier you can bring organizations to the table, the better. Of course, you're going to need to show them something. You're going to need to have a hook that's going to make them want to be involved in it. Um, but if they're at the table with you um, in the beginning, they're going to have more to gain from it. They're going to feel more ownership of the project. Um, that being said, uh, we obviously have done a lot of partnerships with national organizations and local organizations, and they mean really well, but everyone's really busy. No one has any time. So um, it's really, it, part of it can be finding the right person within that organization who then is the go-to that sort of helps you get it out to the rest of the organization. Um, but it really, you know, it, it's, it's trial and error. Um, but I think sort of what's worked for us the best is, is when you get people in there as early as possible, you're doing something for them, um, you know, obviously having them on the site, um, giving them the film is helpful, you know. But there's, yeah, again, you just sort of have to go with it and see. Yeah. Can I also just add one thing? So we work with a lot of partners as well, and I would say that... Um, the number one thing from my perspective is to start out by asking why, like even if you're assuming that they would want to be involved, maybe asking, you know, here's five opportunities that you could, in ways that you could get involved, but what, which is more most appealing to you or sort of most aligned with your organization's needs and goals. And I think if it's, it really is, I mean, that, that part of it in terms mm -hmm. of asking, um, you know, and getting their buy-in at a very high level, I think is, is absolutely key because you're right in terms of saying that on the surface, there's so many things that seem so natural and that for whatever reason, the execution becomes a complete disaster. Right. Um, so on a practical level, I think, you know, sort of um, assessing that at the beginning of the conversation in terms of what they would want to get out of it and sort of presenting them some options. Maybe they want to introduce you at the beginning of the screening or whatever it is so that they can feel that ownership or get that visibility or feel the glamour of being at a film festival, whatever it is. I think that that's sort of key in terms of, um, mm -hmm. you know, having them feel like they're getting, that it's not one-sided. Right. You know, absolutely, and just to follow up on that, with all of our local partners, um, not necessarily the larger national partners, but um, anyone who wants to host the screening, they need to fill out an application that has their goals and why they want to why they want to be involved. So, you know, we can cold call and get people involved, but really, if they're going to get involved in that level, then they need to explain to us what and how they want to use it. We make the program as flexible as possible so that people then do have that ownership, and those tend to be more successful screenings. Um, we can open up uh, to questions from the audience. If anybody does have questions, uh, if you could please come up uh, to use the microphone over here on the right. Any questions? All right. Well, we can um, sort of move on a little to uh, you know discussions of uh, uh, VOD, which is sort of one of the themes of this that we haven't really touched on. Um, I mean, to me, it seems that you know as as you know digital distribution is becoming more and more the norm that you know, everyone's film is going to be up on some sort of DOD platform somewhere, and that, um, you know, all these sort of marketing efforts and promotional efforts that we're talking about are, are sort of absolutely essential, and that, you know, the point is if your film is going to be out there in cyberspace on, you know, for people to buy, um, how are they going to find it, and what is it that's going to draw them there? Um, does uh, anyone here on our panel have any thoughts on sort of the future of VOD and, and how that's going to be monetized, perhaps, Liz? 
<laughs> I, I, I liked how you slipped that in there. Um, you know, it's a, it's like the Wild West out there right now, I have to say, because definitely, you know, the whole sort of uh, what's happening with iTunes, what's happening with VOD, uh, with, and there's a lot of organisations that are out there, for example, like Snag Films or whatever else, that are really trying to monetize it. And there was a, an infamous panel um, earlier on where Morgan Spurlock was on there, and he was sort of saying how, you know, everybody kind of, everybody sort of skips around the numbers. Uh, especially, especially when you get a bunch of theatrical distributors in the room, and and Morgan just sort of said how you know I got a check for you know X amount of dollars and this is what it is and you know and he kind of just laid it out, and I think it's like I was saying it's like early days but it was small number and it's a very very small number but I think you know definitely as we sort of progress into the digital world, people will definitely find ways of being able to monetize certain things. But I think it's the case of uh, being aware of what's out there. You know, again, asking very specific questions. Uh, be mindful about the agreements that you're getting into. Uh, you know, again, ask your peers what, you know, what, they are, what they've been doing. Um, and don't sort of you know lock up those rights because there's, a, there's certainly, you know, people are asking for a long, um, a long sort of period of rights where certainly in digital age things are changing so dramatically. So really, the terms of agreement should be maybe one or two years um, or whatever else. But um, from the B side perspective, you know, we um, we don't believe in the traditional windows, uh, but we ultimately you know want to have our films out there. Certain distribution plans are not the same for every film. Uh, for example, with Crawford. Um, this was a film about the small town in Texas where Bush um, uh, had his ranch. And just due to a timing issue, we absolutely wanted to get that film out before the election last year. And unfortunately, we just didn't have the time to be able to do it in any kind of you know, non-theatrical way. So we went to Hulu and said to them, look, you know, we're going to do a few screenings around the country, uh, but we want you to take this film. And they're known for TV. Uh, and Crawford was the first film that the feature length film that they actually took on board and uh, and it totally took off and people it, people saw it and it was a success and the filmmaker has actually seen some money um, but really as far as a sort of you know visibility point of view it was getting the film out there and to strike while the iron's hot so it's really just sort of you know definitely dig around see what's out there um, it's maybe a little early days, certainly to monetize that kind of front, but um, but I think you know as time goes on, I'm sure it will it will happen sooner or later. Paul, do you have any experience in terms of your last project? No, not on, on the last project. Um, for r music rights issues, we were never able to have it available for download. Um, so I can't speak from experience on that, but um, but certainly with the with the new film that we're working on, um, you know I think really it's kind of what Liz is saying. I mean you just have to be aware of what's happening and what's going on. I mean a year, year and a half, whenever the film is finished, who knows what um, what the landscape is going to be. But um, and is, and also as far as how to be financially rewarded for it, if that's possible, how much is possible. Um, I have no idea, and but I think that I guess the best thing you do is just, yeah, exactly. Talk to the talk to those around you, and just keep um, keep in the loop, be in the know as much as you can, really. Mm -hmm. I would I would actually give one piece of advice in terms of the serial content which we produce, which is, um, you know. The budgets are just at such a different scale. I really think you need to get your mind around that in terms of, you know, if you're coming from a traditional long-form filmmaking background, it's it's shocking. <laughs> and in terms of, you know, if you are, if your goal is, like, I have to make my money back, which is our goal, <laughs> um, you know, we don't, we don't make series that we're not monetizing in some way. And I think, um, you know, it's really important to be realistic and to do your homework about these economics and um, there is a lot of information out there as far as what people are paying if you are you know producing a podcast for example on the lowest end lowest end budget if you're just doing an audio podcast and you're using an ad network to sell your ads so it's just you <laughs> and your audio recording device one man band 
uh, NPR style, you know, but really limited, but you have, you know, a, a unique program, um, you know, there's a lot that you can do in terms of um, promoting it, but then in terms of monetizing, you know, once you get up to the 40, 50, 60, 70,000 viewers or listeners, which is possible and is done on a very regular basis by people who are independent, who don't have a big media company behind them, who are not, you know, involved with celebrities, um, you know, they're more than breaking even. They're able to live off of that. And I think that, you know, similarly to that when blogging first started, no one was making money for like the first three or four years. And people were like, how is this ever going to work? And, you know, traditional publishers were closing and magazines and, publish and book publishers were coming out with less and less product. And there was this like, you know, panic in the writing world. And I think while it's still not a pretty picture, there are definitely many, 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 you know, thousands of bloggers who are making a full-time living and many people who left their job along the way who were starting it as their nights and weekends passion and who eventually you know, made that leap um, through a lot of dedication. And I mean, the one I think very hopeful note when it comes to, um, you know, independent filmmaking is the fact that um, there used to be this massive capital barrier between you and your audiences and you and television advertising, which was the number one thing that the distributors had that you did not. And today there is not that capital barrier. There's no, nothing that you can't do that Warner Brothers is right now doing for their $100 million release of Sherlock with the exception of the iPhone application development. So I, I really think that it's like, you know, a lot of time and energy um, that's required. That's how you're paying for it. But before, it's like you couldn't get on national television. So at least this is a slightly better situation. Still no questions? Um, I, one other um, sort of topic in the heading was about the issue of, of piracy and um, uh, any thoughts in terms of how filmmakers can utilize showing their film for free and sort of putting it out there as a way to start, you know, drawing attention to their film um, and, you know, are there uh, ways to protect against piracy or is it just sort of part of the landscape that uh, filmmakers have to accept? I, th I mean, I know for a fact that the film I did, I mean, someone could go and download it and uh, for free. And, um, you know, that's just, I don't know how I can do anything about that. And I don't really, and personally, I mean, I don't really think, just from myself, I don't think it's costing me a lot of, a lot of sales, really. Uh, just because the amount of people who are probably downloading it are small. But um, I don't know. I mean, I know I've certainly watched films on your website, and it's, um, and I think it's great. I mean, I think that the idea that, um, I think the idea, as a filmmaker, you want a lot of people to see your work, and um, at the end of the, when you're starting a film, you have to kind of ask yourself what your goals are, but I think everyone could be in agreement that they want, to, you know, they want people to see it, so um, I don't know. I mean, I, Personally, I'm open to the idea of streaming it in some form at some point because if you get that many more that many more individuals to see it and to tell their friends about it and um, to enjoy it, then that's a positive thing. Um, but as far as piracy goes, I would you know I wouldn't know how to stop it, and I don't even know. Um, yeah, I don't. I mean, it, it's in some ways it's bad, but. Um, you know, again, if people, it gets more people to see it, then, you know, and if it's not really harming anyone in a financial way, I don't have a huge problem with it personally. Um, certainly at B-Side, we, if it's a high level sort of problem to have, and we do not have a problem with pri piracy whatsoever, because those are the sort of people who are gonna get the film, they're gonna get it anyway, and they're not gonna pay for it. So, um, you know, and again, it's like eyeballs on the film. So we do not have an issue with that whatsoever. Oops, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say that The Guardian actually wrote an article earlier this week about, the, which is like the third or fourth study that showed that um, sort of undeniably at this point that the pirates in the music world are also the number one audience for paid music. Um, and it was, it was against all sort of, you know, sort of conventional wisdom. And I think that, you know, people have this idea that there's like this, you know, robbery taking place, and obviously it's very complicated in terms of intellectual property law and how you, how that affects your overall, um, you know, sort of distribution plans and monetization. But I think you should definitely Google that article for those who are concerned about piracy because it's it's literally been like the fourth or fifth study that's been on a pretty massive scale to confirm that that statistic. Yeah, I'm sorry. 
Uh, we uh, worked on a film called RIP, a remix manifesto, which was basically about free culture and about uh, mashup and DJs and following a DJ in particular, Girl Talk, who basically takes clips of films and music and streams, streams them together and, and performs in front of massive audiences. But really it's to do with sort of copyright and um, all the, sort of the legal aspects of... Um, uh, sort of free film or, you know, music, especially for the music industry. And very early on while we were working on the film, we actually were working with a, a company called Disinformation. We realised, okay, we're trying to sell a film that's about free culture, <laughs> where basically it's like people want things for free. Um, so what we did um, is we decided to take the Radiohead model um, and just say, pay what you want with the film. And we did that on the website. And it was really interesting because we figured, you know, and just pay what you want, whatever, whatever it might be. You can pay, you can get the, you can download the film for zero dollars or however, however much. And we ended up having just under sixteen thousand downloads, and the average amount people were paying were bet was between five and ten dollars. Mm -hmm. So there's an honest, honest bunch out there, I have to say, but I f because they were coming to the website, because it was certainly for the filmmaker, but um, you know, there was a few people that weren't gonna pay for it, but the, the majority of people actually paid something, which I thought was a real, a real eye-opener. Yeah, and the other thing, that, what I think about whenever talking about piracy and, and downloading stuff online is, I grew up and I saw a lot of the films that you know, really inspired me that I carry with me to this day were passed around on VHS tapes that were dubbed from one to the other. How I heard a lot of the albums, the, the music that I love, was people dubbing it off of a record to a cassette tape. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe, um, you know, maybe that's just today's version of that. And uh, I realize it's a lot easier and quicker, so it's not really the same thing. But, um, you know, in a way I kind of do look at it as the same, same sort of deal. Sure, there are no questions out there? <laughs> okay. Any, anything else from any of our panelists? No, I, I was just going to say that I can't really speak very much to this because we essentially pay to acquire rights that are for broadcast and then for streaming, so it's not downloading. Right. Um, but that's POV. Oh, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, as students, student filmmakers, what's our goal as far as film festivals? Are there some that to us more than others? I mean, what do we do to get our names out there as new in the industry? Mm -hmm. sure. What's some ideas? Um, well, you're here at a panel. Talk to as many people <laughs> as possible. Come, you know, chat to us. Um, go to, um, if you can, if there's any events that are around the city or anything else, just, you know, it's all about who you know as well and networking. And you can do that online. Um, you can go to, like, for example, the IFP is a great organization. You've got Media Rights. You've got Docu Club. There's a whole slew of, of great events that happen around the city. And definitely just speaking to people who are there, introducing yourself. And by far and away, you know, you will be able to and also recognize who in the industry is sort of out there doing their thing, maybe interning. At, um, and I'm giving a plug here for B-Side, but no, um, I'm just, no, I'm, I'm joking, but maybe interning at certain organizations. And I feel that if you're sort of knowledgeable, and, and I think it's, it's great because then you get a sense of kind of what you might want to do or what you might end up um, sort of seeing where your films might end up and, and just getting to know other filmmakers and people in the industry. I would also say just really um, educate yourself in terms of the trades, which are still, you know, a, a great source of, um, sort of figuring out what the market appetite is for the type of work that you want to be making. So if you're, you know, um, a fanatical comedy director, whatever it is, that's sort of like, you know, your calling card. Um, there's pe plenty of companies still in New York, even though, you know, it's, the market has shrunk, certainly, especially this year. Um, but that, you know, you could get a foot in the door as even as an intern or whatever, you know, sort of um, entry-level position. And getting inside, I think, is absolutely key. But I also think having sort of a a better understanding of the whole marketplace through reading the trades and keeping up to date. You know, Ann Thompson has an amazing blog and lots of other readers like that who either used to work for Variety and Hollywood Reporter or still do, but have their own sort of independent voice as well. Um, 
you know, they have sort of the ear to the ground as far as what's going on in the festival scene and sort of who's up and coming in terms of, you know, forward thinking distribution. Yeah, also many festivals have distinct identities in terms of the types of films that they showcase. So, you know, do some research in terms of what the content of the films that you're working on are and, you know, look around to see what, you know, what is out there in terms of festivals, if you're making shorts or if you're making feature. Um, I mean, here in New York, um, Eliza had mentioned uh, Rooftop Films is a really great ongoing um, series every summer that does about 40 screenings around the city. And they showcase all range of filmmakers from, you know, student filmmakers to the most, um, you know, experienced that are out there. Um, I mean, another resource is that one of my colleagues at Tribeca who programs for shorts has a, a book called Swimming Upstream that's all about distribution for short films. And it's, it's written by a number of different people who each do chapters on their experience as filmmakers, producers, programmers. Um, that, I think, is probably a really invaluable resource if... Uh, if shorts is where where you're at, and also couldn't get to hurt, you know, to get to know who some of the programmers are at festivals, and you know, say hi, introduce yourself, let them know you're sending your film out there. We all look at way too many films, so uh, it does kind of help sometimes to put eyes on somebody when you're looking at the film. And it's also pretty. Don't be easy. shy. Sorry. It's also pretty easy now to see a lot of the short films that are playing at festivals. You can watch them online, mm -hmm. so you can go and see what um, see and what see what works out there. And um, I mean, when I was in when I was in film school, I um, I, mean, I did internships, which I found really useful, especially for ultimately getting a job, because you have to, you know, odds are you're not going to get paid to make films right out of school. Um, so interning, working on other people's films. Um, you know, and just like everyone's saying, just go to go to any film festivals you can. Especially in the summer, there's a lot of free screenings. Um, Anthology Film Archives has something called New Filmmakers every Wednesday. Um, I mean, there's just there's just a lot of stuff going on, especially living here. So take advantage of it, and um, and then just try and watch as much as you can, meet as many like-minded souls as you can, and um, just dive in as opposed to downloading and whether or not uh, having people that did make uh, donations, they could download it, but people who watch it free to stream it. That way they weren't able to keep it for a longer period of time. Um, no, I mean, it was a, we spoke to the filmmaker about that. He said, you know, uh, it was one of these things where it was, uh, it was kind of a marketing tool, like a promotional tool really to sort of tie into the radio head kind of model because mm -hmm. it was a film and, um, and it was really kind of, uh, we did a, you know, we did some press around it as well. Um, ultimately, the film, I believe, is streaming elsewhere, but it was just sort of part of the, the sort of rollout that we did. Um, and it was just really um, for us to see if we could actually make some money on the film mm -hmm. um, and actually worked hugely to our advantage. Um, in fact, that film, what he ended up doing, which was really cool, is he actually... Uh, if you go to the website, there's he's he's Canadian. He's based in Montreal, uh, but there he actually invites people to add scenes to the film. So every time he shows the film, it's a different version, mm -hmm. and he's got contributors adding to it and adding to the narrative. Um, so that in itself is a really cool component to what he's doing. Um, so I would go go to the website, dig around, see what you can find. But uh, Brett Gaylor, who's the director, really cool guy really uh, savvy and sort of knows how to sort of market his film, especially in the sort of digital world. Um, and he's totally sort of grasped that and, and he's run with it. So um, check it out. It's, he's done some really cool and interesting things with, it, with his film. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and thank you all for coming. <laughs>